Welcome to Brandon Hall Group's Excellence at Work podcast. You will hear from industry leaders covering innovative, cutting edge business, learning, and HR topics that weave current market research and technology into each episode. Our Excellence at Work podcast is hosted by Brandon Hall Group's Chief Operating Officer and Principal HCM Analyst, Rachel Cook. Hi, and welcome to Brandon Hall Group's Excellence at Work podcast. I'd like to warmly welcome Chris Olson, the Director of Corporate Strategy and Partnerships from Class Technologies. Hi, Chris. How are you? Doing great. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you. And also joining us is Michael Rochelle, Brennan Hallgrove's Chief Strategy Officer and one of our principals. Hi, Michael. Hi there. Hi, everybody. And thank you all for listening in or, or watching. Um, however you're accessing our, our podcast, we're happy to have you. A uh, little bit more about Chris. Uh, he brings 20 years of organizational effectiveness experience, primarily operating in the finance industry. Chris oversaw learning and development, performance, employee experience, and engagement. He has led 10 national bank merger and acquisition change management initiatives. That's pretty impressive. And he was able to do this by leveraging technology that focused on experience and modern learning practices. He delivered skills and talent when organizations needed it most. Um, again, I'm, I'm glad you're here with us because um, I've, your experience brings a lot of of um, relevance to what what organizations are going through now and transitioning from more in-person learning to whether it's hybrid or or entirely virtual it's it's a new way of of interacting with each other so i'm really looking forward to hearing more about your your perspective and um, for those of you that are familiar with class a class is a, uh, or just a little bit more information about class. Class is a synchronous online learning platform that adds teaching and learning tools to Zoom. They were founded by education software pioneer Michael Chasen and backed by prominent Zoom board members, Salesforce Ventures, and Super Bowl champion Tom Brady. Uh, our household is a big fan of the Patriots, um, particularly my husband and our boys. I know, Michael, you're a big fan as well. So this is, um, it's nice to see he's also um, supporting ventures like this and involved in um, elevating or, or um, getting involved with, um, with uh, you know, uh, the workplace and um, improving uh, engagement. And, uh, and that's what class does. It improves learner engagement and helps to reduce friction associating, associated with using disparate tools to teach and train online. Also, CLASS is a gold preferred provider with Brandon Hall Group. Uh, they won three awards in 2021. Congratulations. And uh, we today, our, our topic, we're going to be talking about seizing the opportunities of uncertainty, five strategies for success in a hybrid working environment. And uh, this was a webinar that uh, we collaborated with you in, at the end of last year. And so we're going to continue the the discussion and I would like to start with uh, Chris. If you can um, share your point of view of what are some of the advantages to a hybrid or work um, culturally and operationally. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a, a clearly a, a big load of question there, but um, I think my stance on it is that we've just scratched the surface with the potential of where we're going and what the advantages are. So that's what I'm most pumped and excited about because I think it started off where a lot of times, uh, a lot of conversations I have in the market with, with uh, you know, some of our clients or just other thought leaders in the space that they, um, you know, it's like, how are you surviving hybrid? You know, like, like, and it's just like, wait, what do you mean survive? And so I, I get the standpoint that I get the point it's that. a gift uh, to, to like, you know, move from what, the previous like way of work was to the new way um but and, and that's going to be a little bit of a lift sure but i think there's going to be so much potential it's going to outweigh vastly whatever um you know whatever uh um uh you know pain points we're going to have in that process so i think that's the first point around it and and i think there's i think the question a lot of people have is like just well how do we do it how do we do hybrid and and there's just 
no right answer yet to that, I don't think. And I think everyone's going through that exploratory stage. Um, it's funny, the uh, when when we were first talking around like things hybrid, even from the um, the last webinar we did, the, the end point of the year, um, I've been talking with people where they say, yeah, six months from now, when we when we when we master hybrid or when we figure hybrid out, like mm -hmm. well, it's been six months and like we're we're still still figuring it out. So I think it's going to be a while because I think the thing is like there's no one size fits all in the process. But I do think that overwhelmingly the market. Uh, the 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 um, the workforce is clamoring for it, whether it's remote, full on remote, or full on in person. Everyone seems to want to live in that middle. Uh, for instance, today uh, we're a fully remote company at class. I'm sitting in a WeWork office right now, and because I'm meeting with my uh, other colleagues at class in person to do some strategy sessions, and so there's advantages and disadvantages, and it's really just like figuring out what that balance is. So that's kind of my, my thing is like that there's just so much potential, a lot of advantages coming our way. I think there's a lot that we can talk through in the conversation that we've already discovered or are seeing a lot of upward movement with. But um, overall, I think that's that's my sentiment is lots more to come uh, for right. the good. We talked a little bit too earlier about, um, you know, this is a great example. We had this scheduled a few days back and we had a technical um, malfunction. Well, actually uh, our internet went out in the area. We had a lot of construction going on with several office buildings. So it was out of our control. They actually had to get people to come out and fix it. I think it was down for a day. And so we're halfway done, maybe even more than done with our episode and then just went silent. So we were able to, okay, this is a nice little practice run for us. We can reconvene today. And, you know, there's pros and cons. If we were in person and we had, let's say, half our audience weren't able to attend because there was traffic on the way or there was an accident or whatever issues get in your way, just because it's technical doesn't mean that if it's in person, you don't have other unforeseen challenges. Um, the one thing with technical is that you can reschedule and you can, you know, um, you, you can easily come back together, you know, granted, you know, schedules and everything, but, you know, it's a different, um, it's, it's, you know, annoying, however, but it, it's do, it's a little bit more, I think, uh, doable to to do, uh, to be able to do, you know, come back together in a virtual environment than necessarily in a um, in-person environment. So that that is an advantage. And, um, you know, just, you know, we, we're living this day by day. We're all trying to figure this out. And um, Chris, I know you have some also, um, uh, advice or strategies and what you're doing or what class is doing to enhance some of the the um, experiences or unique experiences so that it makes um, it improves the engagement what are what is that what are some of those yeah so it's it's interesting because pri primarily before like everyone lived off of the the notion that in person is the best you know, whatever that is, whether it's um, for, and we focus on uh, like education and for um, for for development, skill development and, and uh, knowledge development. And so with that, like it's always been traditionally thought of that that is the best, the end all be all. And there's advantages there for sure, like the interactivity, the connection, they can have the interplay. And so, you know, theoretically higher engagement um, and not theoretically, like it is, a, it's a known fact, like when you get to work with others, that you're just more involved in the process. And then, you know, you take your 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 live sessions that everyone shifted because they had no choice to go to web conference tools, whether it's you know Zoom, Teams, WebEx, what have you. Uh, then, like it, it, there was advantages that they found in that process that that they didn't realize were there. Like, well, one cost savings is a big one. We're not having to pay for flights and for uh, people to be tired and and run ragged and and now you don't have to make it so it's like you know a, a full-on day or two day like workshop sessions because you got them all together you can spread it out and sprinkle it over time so the human mind can digest and process and have more of a journey versus an event and so those are some of the easy obvious that came through but i think one that's really exciting for us is the data now you can actually like understand more interactivity that's happening 
and that can you can serve things up in real time for uh, someone hosting a, a class session to know in real time where to focus and who to focus on based off participation metrics. Um, and then you can make it very easy to help guide the focus of where uh, the end user needs to focus on uh, on demand, whether it's a video screen or whether it's content, uh, because the way that we want to do is everyone knows that there's the um, screen share model of like, all right, it's the lecture, everyone watch my screen, I'm gonna talk this through, maybe you're lucky if I throw in some poll questions. Well, we kind of wanna take that and turn it on its head quite a bit so that we're opening up a portal for other users to interact with the content themselves because it's no longer just watch my PowerPoint or my, my Google slide deck. Let's go ahead and like have you actually create the interplay and not only do that, but have you do that with, um, with your peers. And so a lot of things that we've done are really guided around collaboration and human connection because a lot of it has shifted. It's not so much the technical skill, but it's more around like how to have effective conversations, whether it's giving negative performance review feedback or um, sales enablement and, and, uh, and, and customer service coaching. Our breakout rooms make it really super cool. Like we, we love showing that off because you get to actually uh, see who's in the breakout room like visually and their participation levels within and be able to share content with them in a physical way. So technology is kind of like taken out of being the barrier and it is now enabling for the human interactions to actually come through in a, in a much more seamless way. So those are a few of the things that we we are really jazzed about and, and, and we're loving the potential of where we're going. Um, we're, we are jazzed around all the different things that we're talking about in our meeting today with what we are doing and kind of the the spaces where others haven't gotten into yet because we're focusing on the live synchronous uh, sessions of people learning and interacting together. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really important because I think you're bringing up something that might be an advantage to using a platform versus being in person because you can almost get additional information about people because they are on a platform versus of even if you were standing, you know, in a classroom setting, you're basically down to scanning the audience and seeing if you can pick up on body language or, you know, oh, that person keeps folding their arms. Maybe they're finding this information, you know, they, they don't agree with it. And, you know, it's a lot of like sifting through the tea leaves, you know, and getting out a crystal ball to figure out what's happening. So mm -hmm. I think, I just like to point out that this may be one of these rare circumstances where a virtual technologically enabled interaction between two people or a group may have advantages to it over being in person to make the to make everything more efficient and, and more effective. So that's a that's a, a really cool paradigm, I think, for for the audience. It could be an advantage in doing it this way versus worrying about how it's gonna be the same as in person. Mm -hmm. Maybe in some cases it's better. And I'm kind of getting accustomed to some of these virtual meetings and as long as I have the webcam and others do, uh, I feel that we're, we are almost in the room together. I feel that, you know, Chris, even though you're in San Francisco, I think, um, Michael, you're not too far from me, but we're not in the same office. However, I still feel that we're somewhat in the same room together. So I, I you know, this is just me personally, I can't speak for everybody else, but I feel that as long as you're able to create that that rapport and you make an effort to ask questions and to learn about each other and you know not just the work that you're doing but also what's happening around you or as far as you know your family and you know things that um that humanize you or that you are um, genuinely interested in the other person or other people just like you were in person. I mean, just because you're in person, you can come off as abrasive, disinterested, <laughs> and you could run, you know, you could turn someone off that way. So, you know, just like you would in person, you have to make that extra effort virtually. And it may be a little bit time consuming. It may take an extra five minutes, 10 minutes, um, you know, so you need to allow for that and think about it, you know, 
and you know try to also be respectful of time too but um but it's important yeah, yeah it's think, kind of funny you mentioned that because um often what i hear from people is the the shift to hybrid has caused two things one they're able to connect with more people that they haven't had an opportunity to connect with before because they were so used to like proximity bias with like i'll just walk down the hallway and that's the water cooler talk well now you can have water cooler talk with anybody you want to and so because it's just two clicks of your mouse and you're talking with someone face to face like you don't even have to walk down a hallway and then the other thing that's interesting is people said that they actually felt more connected oddly because we're in your home i see your background and where you live and it's just kind of interesting when you think about that that shift it's not like yes you're sitting in my office with my pretend bookshelf of the books that i've read or whatever to try to impress you it's more of like well that's actually where you live like 24 7 and um which i just find fascinating and the other piece to add on top of, of those points is that a big piece i think that hybrid can provide and there's stats that 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 support this is psychological safety in in this and because the cycle in order for i think for most organizations to be effective um you have to have psychological safety for them to share their thoughts and ideas in a space where they don't feel it's going to come against them and uh, there's a lot of conversations where they're feeling that because they have a better balance and sense of like, if they have a bad day, if they're being stressed, their pet is right next to them to comfort them. Or mm -hmm. they're, um, you know, there's a lot of think, things that comfort uh, uh, brings from being at home to be able to handle a lot of that. But I still think, sure, people still long for, uh, you know, connecting together in person as well, and I think it's just about balance in that process and finding that that right that right point. I think HR is going to struggle at figuring out what are the policies that can allow for that. But mm -hmm. but I think really once we get to that point of figuring out the right balance for things, um, mm -hmm. everyone's going to be a lot happier and more engaged. And I think businesses will be too because their bottom line is going to be improved from the performance of the of the well-being of the of the their workforce. So who would you say is responsible for the structure and the, um, you know, kind of the process for for this hybrid work environment? Is it the manager? Is it the leader? Is it HR? Yeah, I th again, balance. It's probably a mix of both. Uh, I think it's a cocktail. Uh, you know, I think that the structure, a lot of the policy process is probably going to be driven from HR for the most part. But I think um, a, a good HR team is going to be very strategic and involve the other players into the process and not be the ones to call the shots. They're going to bring others in to make it a collaborative um, uh, 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 workflow and, and how in the decision making process to be able to do that. Um, I, I think the managers are going to absolutely be key in the process because I think the thing that everyone struggles the most with, and this is not even technology related or hybrid or not, is just communication. And I think managers are absolutely critical to be involved in that process of communication. And so I think the, that, the, that they have to be taken in consideration as almost the main factor in how the communication process works in, in whatever your setup is versus in-person or, or uh, remote hybrid. So that open dialogue is critical to, to making sure, you know, if you are moving back into the office, how do people feel? Um, what are their expectations? What are the expectations from from the managers? You know, and and making sure that that's continuous and that that they can read issues or challenges that may play a part, and you know that could hinder the performance or the retention. Um, you know, because I'm hearing a lot of mixed emotions from everyone. You know, um, our clients, large companies technology companies you know so it's really that's that's going to be critical is that that open dialogue and yeah, one, plan. One, has one point too that uh it may be being master the obvious but i think we've spent too much time and i think it's our opportunity here to not have people think that hybrid is a negative term you know it doesn't have to be looked at as you know, it's a negative aspect of what we have to deal with right now because mm -hmm. there are organizations that are listening to this right now saying, well, before the pandemic, I already had the majority of my 
employees not in the office every day or going into remote locations or in transition but we've been living with hybrid and then there's some companies that say i'm trying to i think we i think what you're offering chris as an idea is hybrid does not have to be synonymous with the pandemic and being negative it's saying let's all recognize for a variety of different factors even if a company shifts their business model you know there are companies now that are like you're in we work right now like a lot of companies are saying you know what we just don't even spend the money on physical presence let's go yeah. so i think it's great if we could turn the tables on hybrid and say it's just a fact of life and it's not a negative or a positive it's just companies are in all different stages of dealing with this and mm -hmm. the central idea is is how do you create an exciting experience when you're in that, when you're dealing with that environment and stop thinking about it as it's, you know, it's a bad, and I think that's where we have to, that's where we have to get to, is to say, yeah, you know, completely make that point to people. Because there's two, two thoughts I have on that. Um, one, I think people are shifting and are adopting, it, it, it's, it, their hand is being forced, but it's making them go, Okay, like all those articles you try to, you know, make us in the the suits and the C-suite read to understand this. Okay, it's it's growing on us now because we realized productivity wasn't lost. Um, I think what's happening is like they do have to address burnout. Uh, that's that's obvious. I mean, that was well before, but now people's you know kitchen table is now their desk, and work is always staring them in the face. And I think we need to address the 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 work life balance in this process a lot, but. When, one of the things that I did just before um, I joined class was overseeing a, another another bank merger, which uh, those are those are a wild ride. And um, but what we were doing was um, shifting to have about approximately 8,000 employees be trained on a new core banking platform that was going live in three months. And it's a very structured process of okay, we have 8,000 people. Um, hundreds and hundreds of trainers that are going to do this over three months, hundreds of thousands of hours of training being conducted. Um, and that's just the core banking platform. There's like another 200 systems that all touch the ecosystem and processes they have to learn. And it's just like information dump. And, and so they all thought it has to be done in person. And the, the FinTech company that we used was like, hey, look, this all has to be in person. But then the pandemic hit. And it was like, Oh shoot, like, how is this gonna work? And and they were like, it can't be done. We don't know how this is gonna work. And so we we actually, um, I'll, I'll, I'll refrain from saying the web conference tool that was used, but that tool did not work. And so like for the training and it, and what ended up happening was, uh, th this is getting to your point, to a point around employee experience, um, is that the, the platform that we had was not effective for learning and development. And so because of that, we actually switched to a different one. Um, I will say the positive one that we did switch to, which was Zoom. And so because the experience was so difficult and there was so much concern around the business bottom line outcome of people not being able to access the training and having a good experience on there, that they were worried that, you know, our bank teller is gonna be able to process transactions when we go live in this. And so like when it affected their bottom line outcome, it turned into like we need to invest in tech and shift from the ones that we thought was going to work that it was driving to be able to make sure that the business outcome does come out on top and so i think to your point around what are you know what is the workforce what are employees expecting from us in this process um not to be self-serving because i'm going to use stats that come from somewhere else is that i think tech plays a big major part in this that we didn't think about and the, the reason tech plays a big part in it is that that's what you know, the employees have expected because their consumer life is, is really like a severe contrast from their workplace life. I can talk into my watch and say, hey Siri, call Madam President and it will call my mom like right away. I don't even know my immediate family members' phone numbers. Like <laughs> I know it's probably a weird thing to think about, but like in a pinch, I couldn't call them but I don't need to know it because I can literally just log into whatever Apple device and then immediately they're there. So there was an interesting article that came out in HBR about a hybrid world. And there is a staggering statistic in there that said that employees are 230% more engaged and 85% more likely to stay beyond three years in their jobs 
if they feel that the company has a technology that supports them at work. Like that is a mind blowing factor um, that I just learned about. And now it, it just supports that all the more. I think where we're gonna struggle with is like the businesses shifting their processes to allow for that. Like what does talent acquisition and onboarding look like now when your uh, job interviews are gonna be done uh, you know, remotely. And so everyone's kind of done it, but I think it's gonna take a while to master it. And then how do you just make that employee experience process incredibly smooth and seamless? Because that's what where the expectations are, I think. Yeah, I think you're I think you're right. We had some research back a while back where we were looking at the different impact of things on avoid on the employee value proposition. And one of the things we threw out there was, you know, the technological world that you live in. And it was staggering. We thought it would be kind of high, but it was upwards of 60 to 70% of employees would rather figure out a workaround than use the technology that they're exposed to at work. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I, I've said it a hundred times in advisory calls, the analogy I use is, you know, I'm home in this ubiquitous environment of what I think is the right way to use tech. And then I cross the parking lot to go into the side of my company and I enter the dark ages. It's like a medieval time, you know, it's just the, and the parking lot is just some kind of weird, you know, time travel vehicle of going back 500 years ago. And, and people are just done with that. Like they were, they were going on and on about modern look and feel. And, you know, I'm not asking it to be super complicated. I just wanted it to be, feel like what I use outside of work. And I think you're, you're spot on. The other point I want to add really quick, so I know we're coming up on time, is the companies have to realize that there's a convergence coming between human element and digital transformation. You know, that's that's unavoidable. Some people call it the you know the the fourth technological revolution. Mm -hmm. And in our research, employees, depending on point of view, fall on either side of that. They some will say technological revolution not good for me because I'm a factory worker and I just got replaced by a robot. Yeah. But I think that, but I think we have to address that there's this convergence coming. This is just a, a, a sector of that convergence between digital and human. Mm -hmm. And we just have to really be thinking about what kind of experience we want to create because we can't avoid that convergence. And that's where upskilling and taking those people that are in a traditional type of, of, you know, manufacturing role that they are accustomed to developing them into, you know, a different type of role because you still need humans to um, to humanize the technology. And that's what we're finding is so critical here. And instead of being afraid of the technology, they we need, you know, maybe not the employee because we need to make it better and more um, accessible and, 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 you know, available to them that there are opportunities. And, you know, we saw companies that had, um, went through the pandemic and they were able to take, um, you know, call centers or take people that were in the stores and transition them to different roles that were call centers that were, um, you know, that, you know, they really needed these roles and they didn't have, they, they did not have the skill sets at that time, but they were able to qu quickly through their technology be able to make that transition. And I think that another thing we need to consider is the technology. You know, we we also focus a lot about experience, but both of you said it, Chris and Michael, if that experience of the technology is not, uh, um, you know, if it's not seamless, if it's not easy, if it's not simple, if it's not um, engaging, you're going to turn people away. It's frustrating. I mean, think about if you go to um, a checkout at a store, right, and you have to wait, and uh, great, we have the self-checkout, but, but if that that transaction's not working well for you. I'd rather wait in line for a teller or for a, a person to help me. So, but if I go, I can check out my stuff. There's no glitches. I'm out the door in, you know, two minutes. I love it. So mm -hmm. we really think about that. It's yeah. funny you mentioned that. Like there's, uh, <laughs> the banking industry is right for all that. And I, it's funny fun watching the news because you can tell like banks and technology are, they're playing nice together right now, but you, something's going to happen there, I think in the near future. But um, like I talk to people right now and someone was on my team and, and she was like uh, telling me like, I've never written a check. 
Like I am, she's, she was 30 years old and she's like, I've never written a check. I've never needed to. And so it's just very interesting to see those types of things go away, us moving to, to more digital means. And it's like, it is the way of life. Um, right. So I think you're right that the, 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 the tech needs to match the experience and expectations. Um, and, I, and I think the other thing too, is that the bank, the, not the bank, the, but the workforce, the, the way that businesses operate, their operating model is actually gonna be just as critical to the things that they invest in, um, because you can say your culture is empowering, but then why do you have seven layers of approval to get anything done? And so I think like sometimes the barriers in providing a good experience comes from the policies and mandates that you have in your business practices. So those are gonna have to shift and adjust um, to get more with the times. But I think that that there, now there's more opportunity, there's a great reset to be able to, to do that. Um, and that's where I think there's good goodness around figuring out like when to involve and when not to involve others in process to make it more um, more more grassroots organic oriented and, and more democratized uh, for in the workplace for their experiences. So I, I'm, I'm excited for the future and all that. I mean, there's because I love uh, memes uh, that, that come out lately. Uh, the reason I like those, it's almost like not just the data that get, makes its way into you know circulation of trade publications and all that, but it's almost like the public kind of reflecting some things. I saw an interesting meme that that was floating around that seemed pretty popular and and it had a lot of likes, which was for those that work remotely, what are the pros and cons? And then someone replied back, pros are like sleeping in, showering on my own time, like no traffic, peace and quiet, being able to run errands like not overly tied to my work and controlling my schedule basically. And then the cons were people making up articles about me wanting to return to the office. So I think that there's something where a lot, the, the, a lot of businesses and employers are thinking, we're gonna return to normalcy. And I, I just think like they're in for a rude awakening because there's been a shift that's moved over to the employer, to the employees to kind of dictate a little bit more terms around that when you, I hate to use buzzwords, but you know things like the great resignation or the great reshuffle or whatever you want to call it. I think that that's playing out in real time for us to see that things are changing for, and I think for the better. Well, it's a good way to wrap up today, Chris. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us and our audience um, some key insights here on, you know, thinking about we're headed into 2022. So there's a lot, you know, there's a lot to consider for, for leaders, for managers, for employees. And, um, you know, I think it could be positive you know, in how you reflect and how you, um, the action you take. So Chris, if anyone wants to find you, what's a good way to reach you or your organization? Yeah, excellent. So, I mean, anyone is free to, uh, you know, poke me on, on LinkedIn, I'd love to connect there, obviously, but uh, for those that are just generally interested in what we're doing uh, with, with uh, class, happy to just check out class.com and you'll be able to see what we're doing to reinvent for the corporate training learning space as well as in the education market for anyone, anyone interested. Fantastic, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everyone. Please don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. Take care. Bye-bye.